I suggest we continue with our second talk of this session uh, by Lubomir Butzek and Daniel Santillan about um, yeah, WebGL magic and scientific data. Stage is yours. Um, all right. Um, hi. Thanks, Joachim. Uh, so I think yeah, we've heard a little from, from Ivan, maybe a bit more enthusiastic than me. Let's see. I'll try. Um, uh, that, that we can actually use the browser to, yeah, to do some nice things. Um, and, and we're going to talk about um, two of these things. So, um, yeah, we've, we've been working and looking into some of the things that, that he has also been actually presenting. So, actually uh, showing scientific data directly in the browser. Um, so, in this respect, so we will be talking about, uh, so... Uh, we called it Plotty and Graphly. I, I think having a Y at the end of the library makes it much better. Um, and so uh, one, one takes a bit the approach of, of looking at, at uh, raster uh, manipulation and, and this rendering in, in the web browser. And the other we, well, we worked with, with uh, vector graphics and, and how we can actually move away from that and, and, and do things in, in the shader to, to actually get some performance. Um, so maybe from us, just to say, so uh, we're from AOX. Um, I, maybe uh, you've seen so, some talks about uh, raster manipulation from Joachim Marchete, and also Fabian tomorrow, and our colleague uh, uh, Peter uh, will be talking about some other libraries. Um, so we work mainly, um, basically most of our developments are free and open source, so, so I think um, uh, our main client being ESA, I think it's really nice to see that, um, that we can move like that and do our developments like that. And, and what we have seen is that um, as we go along the years and, and, and yeah, go from one project to the other, we're actually trying to uh, we see that, that modular development, so instead of doing like big things uh, that, that are usually don't fit exactly the use case of, of every person, we're trying to go like more piecewise. So we just have s small modules that, that are kind of interchangeable and, and, and can be used by everybody. And I think we're, we're seeing this more and more. And we're seeing in that, that let's, our, our GitHub repos are are being used, I think, uh, and we're seeing some pull requests because they are uh, like nice individual components that, that can be really used uh, independently. So we see this like uh, GeoTIFF.js and uh, Plotty.js and, and Graphly, maybe at some point, uh, which I'll, I'll present a little bit more. Um, so yeah, that's, let's see, that's a bit about us. Um, I'll let, uh, Lubo talk a little bit about um, Plotty and, and uh, maybe I think this was um, the initial stages were presented already the the last Phosphor G uh, so uh, yeah we'll we'll talk a little bit or he'll, he'll present a little bit about um, what new things have have come along and what what he has also helped uh, implement or integrate at least yeah so. Okay, uh, hi everybody. Um, I will first uh, shortly introduce Plotty. Um, Plotty is a really lightweight uh, library for putting uh, one band raster data on a canvas. That's sim as simple as it can get. Um, the, as as uh, Daniel said, it has already been uh, introduced three years ago. Since then, the, dev the development has uh, gone to a phase where everything that we want Plotty to do, it already does. And the main addition uh, has been the moving to the ES6 module style uh, to be able to import uh, more easily and to go with the, stan uh, the standard movement. And also adding the raster uh, algebra functions to be run directly on the shader. Uh, as being said, the purpose uh, of the library is to quickly set a color scale to the data that we give it. Uh, it 
tries to use the WebGL if possible, which all new browsers definitely can. It also provides a fallback to software, uh, to standard software uh, rendering if the WebGL is not provided. However, uh, in most of the browsers, this will not happen. The motivation to create the library some years ago uh, was to um, try to uh, colorize the raster uh, images in the browser uh, because in some cases it might be much faster, in some cases not. It always depends on the use case and on the speed with which you can actually put, uh, get the image to the user's browser. So previously all the renderings were done or by us uh, in a WMS with some preset styles, but then every change of the style needed a new fetch on the server. So another option then emerged as uh, getting the full file uh, by, by WCS and then try to render it by WebGL. Another option uh, which emerged a few years earlier is with uh, GeotiffJS uh, to get the part of the GeotiF uh, parsed and then only the relevant data or relevant bands will be uh, visualized. So the, what the library can do uh, is basically only these things. It should be enough for the use case that we provide it uh, to. Uh, so uh, the new thing is the data set combination where for each pixel, uh, given the math formula using uh, the plus minus signs and the normal mathematic operations, uh, and also some functions like sinus, cosinus, basically anything that the uh, underlying GLSL uh, shading language can provide, uh, compute a value. And this value will then be colorized based on a color scale. I've actually uh, prepared a demo, which then I figured out that is not working, so sticking back to the screenshots, good old screenshots. First is a static demo, which uh, on the click just showed some arbitrary data. It, this is a sinus function. So the first part actually only produces our values and then the plotty plot uh, chart is created. It targets the canvas element, it sets the data, and it sets the width and the height. That's all the input that it needs. You can set the color scale or use the default one and then you render it through the canvas. If we want to show it on some more sensible data, uh, the, another image is showing uh, uh, digi uh, data from the uh, upper, uh, synthetic aperture radar where several input uh, element, uh, several input elements can trigger the change of the color scale, like here, where the change is instant because we are rendering everything in the web uh, GL. We can set the min and max, basically select the domain, which uh, can then be either clamped or not, which also has an influence uh, on the resulting image, of course. If we don't want to directly render only image to a canvas, uh, we can use the rendering to a canvas, for example, in open layers, uh, which uh, allows to render over the open layers canvas, where the demo that uh, you see is rendering digital elevation model on a open layers uh, base map. And the uh, valleys and the mountains are cut using the clamp uh, functionality. The last demo is showing uh, Sentinel-2 RGB near infrared image, where here all the, uh, the first three bands, RGB, are used, uh, where just the intensity of the image is uh, computed for each pixel, which means R plus G plus B equal uh, divided by three and then a simple color scale is applied on the resulting values. And by simply clicking a button, you can change the math expression that you are applying on the image, uh, which for example here is uh, 
good old NDVI index and setting a domain and, for example, different color scale. A quite similar image can be obtained using different formula where uh, one of many formulas for detecting chlorophyll A is used uh, where, again, the three bands, uh, uh, here the RGB bands are used and their specific wavelengths. And again, a domain is set on this resulting image. Uh, those, were, those were just a few ex really simple examples what the library can do. And there are several more. For example, you could um, use a cesium to visualize a 3D view, and then Plotty can be also uh, added on top of that to visualize some uh, nice uh, behavior or uh, some motion. With this, uh, I'm actually giving word to Daniel to talk about the second part of our attempt. Um, thanks. So yeah, go, going just for a second back, maybe hopefully no need to go to the fragment data directly. So yeah, you can use the library to use some expressions, hopefully a little bit more and you know, easier than having to dig, dig down deep into uh, what you're doing. So, all right. Um, so the next uh, library is uh, roughly, and the, the idea was, uh, so not necessarily EO data, that is why it's, it's um, in brackets in the title. Uh, basically, uh, we have seen in many projects that, that we need to, to show a scatter plot. And we've seen a lot of screenshots of sewing, like uh, timelines and things like that. So points connected with lines. And um, when we began with this adventure, we basically said, okay, it makes sense to use scalable vector graphics in the, in the browser. Easy, you can manipulate them, interaction, you have everything that there is uh, to have, but um, we have seen that this is not always the solution we need. So there is like a crazy amount of libraries that allows you to do this, that they are sometimes based on D3 or not, they're their own thing. And they are usually like, you can generate so many types of plots. And um, But when it comes to solving your specific use case, if, if it's not matching exactly what the library does, it gets complicated quite, quite quickly, and this is what we were seeing. And especially one of the things that, that was a main issue for us is that we were trying to render, I don't know, more than 6,000 points at least, um, which, which was really difficult to do with, with SVG. Uh, the, the browser resources for that is, is ridiculous. Um, so we began with the idea like, oh, okay, shader can do everything, right? <laughs> Um, so let's do it in the graphics card. Um, I mean, basically, it's well, not inventing anything new, but I think we've brought uh, multiple things together that work really nicely together, and I think it, it's um, quite a nice thing to have, so this, this is something at least that we needed. Um, so maybe let's compare uh, vector graphics against Rasta. So what, what does the one thing give you and the other not? So with SVG, you have like really nice manipulation. You have groups. You can uh, transform complete groups. You, you can do a lot of really nice uh, like animations and really a lot of nice stuff. Uh, but as I said, one of the main limitations is really how much stuff you can use. So it, it gets the system gets quickly overwhelmed. So it, you have all of this as nodes and this has to be kept track of. So um, that's quite intense. And the raster on the other hand, like once you render it, you're basically saying this pixel is this color and that's it. Like uh, there's no real way of interacting with this or yeah, there are some ways of doing it, but no trivial ways. So it's, it's difficult to interact and, and to manipulate, but it's, it's like super fast usually, I mean, depending on how you use it, but yeah, that's the idea. Um, so what did we do? We thought, okay, let's, 
try to win back the things that we lose using Rasta. So basically, um, how do we address and, and get information of what we're rendering? And what we do is, and this is often done in, in computer graphics to just render um, the image twice. And once you, you render like what you're showing to the user, and the other time you use a unique color, and you can go insane. You have, uh, the, the human eye does not differentiate, but if you're picking the color, you have like one billion combinations, you know, one, two, three, six, 16 million. Uh, so you can render a lot of things and then just use a different color for every point or depending on what you're rendering. So, uh, and then you, can, you have this raster and when you move, move the mouse over, you just pick the color and use the color as, as a reference to your actual attribute. So you, you keep the interactivity there. Um, here is so just the, the code for uh, reading the pixel value, which is super fast. Uh, just You can do it on mouse over, so that's no problem. Um, the next thing we combined is, um, so um, it would be nice to just show, show rectangles um, as, as in the plot, but uh, as soon as you're showing one or two parameters, you want to differentiate them somehow. So you need, need different forms. You need like uh, triangles and squares and um, it would be quite painful or I mean at least not as efficient to do this as, as primitives, so actually rendering this. So again, the fragment shader to the rescue, you can do some pixel manipulation uh, which works great. So we, we use just the dot uh, primitive we're rendering and so there's some, yeah, really nice, uh, let's say, uh, uh, descriptions of, of what can be done and, and great resources linked here, uh, with, which gave a lot of inspiration. And, and apart from that, you, you can use uh, instancing, which again, even further, so, so you're using like an instance of the same object with uh, different characteristics. I don't know how deep we want to go into this. Uh, so what you do is uh, you basically define your, your information, let's say in JavaScript, generate some attributes of what you need, like uh, the position, uh, the value, uh, size, and, and symbol. Let's say this would be five, um, five attributes you have for each of the dots you're representing, and then you bind this, uh, create a buffer, and pass it, say the location for, for the shader, and then basically pass it, pass it to the shader, let's say. Uh, this is how you define and, and pass the information uh, to the shader. Uh, instancing is uh, WebGL2, uh, uh, but there's compatibility for WebGL1 where you can try to get the extension and if the browser supports it. Uh, yeah, so I think I will not go more into detail. If there are questions, just feel free afterwards. So what can you do? So how, how long time? Just to one minute. All right, so I'm, all right, so, um, well, this is taking longer than I expected. So this is basically what you can do in the shader. You can do some calculations of uh, the distances and then you can um, create different shapes for each of the dots you're rendering. So this, this gives you, like for example, this would be how you render a circle using just the, the let's say, dot primitive, which would be a rectangle. And this is basically how it looks like. So we're here, here it's an example of, of three different parameters we're rendering uh, with, with the scatter plot. And they are all just dot primitives, but just in the fragment shader, we uh, apply some calculations to manipulate each of these points. And the, the other neat feature that, that we combined is, like, let's say, debounce rendering. So instead of uh, rendering for every manipulation that you do, uh, you, you do introduce a debounce rendering that uh, you actually use a fixed image 
and manipulate the image, like scale it and transform it. And once the movement is done, um, the, the rendering is done again. So these th three things are combined to, to create a really strong and, and flexible, uh, let's say, not only scatterplot, but mainly scatterplot um, rendering library, which we think it's quite nice to have and we have used in many projects already. Um, all right, so depending on the questions, uh, maybe in the five minutes I can give like a, I'll just give like a super short to give you an example of what this means. Uh, oh, sorry. So let's say basically this is it, you can uh, interact with it, uh, you can zoom in, zoom out, and again, you can, for each of, of these values, you can um, um, uh, get information on, on every point, and as you have the data here, you can play with, with filtering. Um, so there's a lot of uh, stuff going on, you, you can, as we're doing it directly on the shader again, you can play with the color scale, which is, uh, you can change the color scale, which parameter is rendered. So, yeah, a lot of possibilities. And yeah, that's basically it. So feel free to give it a try if you're using some plots. You, the data can be loaded just in a certain object and arrays. So it should be fairly easy to integrate some of your projects. All right, so thanks. Yeah, yeah thanks for the great talk. Uh, I know there's been a lot of work <laughs> and, and sweat going into it. So um, are there any questions from the audience? <laughs> of course. Is this ready for production? <laughs> uh, yeah, you'd reserve this one from the previous, right? Uh, <laughs> is this ready for production was the question. Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, depends on your production. Um, no, I mean, uh, it works. Um, will there, might, be, might there be a bug somewhere? For sure. Uh, but uh, I mean, we use it in a what in ESA we call pre-operational, which is important because it's on our servers and not on their servers. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it has had a good, let's say, use from different users, and, and some bugs have been found, and we try to keep track and, and solve the things that appear. Yes, you, you try to fix the 95% and the 5% uh, left, uh, yeah, you try to fix when it pops up, yeah. Okay, next question. No? Don't be so shy. <laughs> ah, there. Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the, the question was if it integrates with, with, well, with other tools, like, for example, open layers. Um, difficult to say. I mean, um, in principle, you give this thing a canvas element, and that's it. Like, it doesn't need more. The, the question is, I don't, I don't know, like, how you combine a plot with a map. Uh, I, I guess this thing could render over the open layers canvas. Uh, I, maybe there's some conflicts on which rendering is triggered first and the other, but I don't know, you could just create a window that, let's say, in open layers, you click something and then you get a timeline uh, with, with a pop-up or some, and this should work more or less out of the box. You just have to style the, the container you put it in and that should be it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Is there no one else? 
Okay, good. Then, yeah, give applause to the presenters. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you.